Uh, so welcome uh, um, for our um, session on um, AI and higher ed today. And today joining me is Peter Fultz, who will introduce himself in a second. But Peter, it's it's great to have you because you've been on so many of uh, our um, webinars that we've hosted, uh, mainly as the moderator. And so we really haven't gotten to hear your your side or your expertise around AI. Um, so I'm excited to be here with you today uh, to discuss that. Um, my name is Noren Dias. I'm the Director of Product Management for Humanities and Social Sciences here at Pearson. Uh, and just a bit of a background, I was, uh, at the beginning of the year, I was asked to by the company to look into uh, generative AI and its impacts on higher education uh, as, a, as we move forward. I don't think at the time anybody expected it to have the impact that it did, but it did. Um, and as a matter of fact, that is where um, I was introduced to Peter. It was suggested that I reach out to you for uh, for many good reasons. And so I'll let you introduce yourself, Peter. Great. Thank you, Norrin. Yeah, and it's a pleasure to be here. And yeah, as, as just a quick introduction, I'm currently a research professor at the University of Colorado in Cognitive Science. Um, but throughout my career, I've really been working at this intersection of AI and education with a focus of how do we integrate AI in education as, as a way not to replace what teachers do, but to enhance what teachers do and to help students. And so I've done that really on both sides. One as a professor where I have used a lot of AI in my classes as helping students and helping me. And I've also worked on the side of industry, including working uh, for Pearson and helping ensure that we can get out tools that will be really effective and used by students and really helpful to teachers. So I really see what I gets me excited is about working with AI, but using it as a way where we try to understand what are the real tasks that educators are trying to do and how do we apply this in ways that it's gonna really help them. Yeah, um, and so much has changed in such a short period of time. But as I said, uh, you know, I just sort of was suggested that I reach out to you for um, for a variety of good reasons. One is that you're an expertise in this in these fields, in the fields of generative AI and language models. But also, you actually worked at Pearson for a while. Uh, you developed a company that we had acquired, um, and that is some of the technology that we still use to this day in a couple of our products. And so, um, you've been a really great help in um, sort of. Uh, guiding us along this journey um, of which we, I still feels like in many ways, we're sort of at the beginning of it, even though it's been for almost a year now that uh, this has been happening in higher ed. Um, but I, I wanted to start today a little bit to discuss some of the, the changes that we've seen already in, in a very short period of time. Um, right off the bat, we started uh, by doing a survey of instructors and students, uh, at, you know, back in February. We've recently rerun a similar survey and gotten some sort of preliminary results. And interestingly, one of the questions we asked was, you know, how enthusiastic or concerned you are as an instructor about the impacts of AI and higher ed. Um, and, you know, while not much has changed, actually, it hasn't shifted quite nearly as much as you might might expect, given the sort of the, the actual impact that it has had. Um, what we have noticed is that some of the enthusiasm, some of those that were excited are sort of less enthusiastic now. It's a small margins, but, you know, we've moved a, a few of those into the, the concerned category, whereas about, we had about 22% uh, who were concerned at the beginning, and now we're up to 26%. So I think that sort of suggests that as you move forward, and now people are getting to experience it more, they're getting a little bit more sort of awareness of what the potential uh, downsides are. But, you know, outside of that sort of shift, we we haven't really seen too much. Every, there's about 25, 26% that are neutral. And, every, you know, it's it's split pretty evenly on, on the other side. And so um, any thoughts on this? Uh, and, um, you know, the fact that instructors definitely recognize the need to embrace it because it is going to impact them. But, uh, you know, wh what are your, uh, what are you seeing around this? Yeah, and I've talked to a lot of professors, both at my university and other universities, to to gauge both their interest and their concerns about it. And I'll admit, I'm a, I'm a little worried that there are a large number of people who are concerned about it. I'm also worried that there's a lot of people who are not uh, really aware of it or aware of the potential impact that it might have on their classes. Um, and I think I mean, there's a number of things that 
uh, still need to happen. I think one of the things is it's incumbent on universities sort of at a larger administrative level to start informing the faculty and helping them thinking about what their policies are and potentially teaching them or how to adjust their classes to chat GPT, large language models, or sort of any of this kind of new AI. And then I think at the same time, I've encouraged a lot of the faculty and those who are concerned about it is that say that this is the time to really start to try to embrace it, to start thinking about how does it fit in the class? So uh, there's a lot of potential ways to enhance what they're doing, but it does mean that there's going to be some changes in how they do things. And I think over, over this session today, we can talk more about some of those different kinds of changes that are going to have to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, that that's definitely true. Like embracing it also requires sort of a fairly significant amount of work on their end as they sort of redesign some of the, the assessments and course uh, materials that they, that they do, have delivered in their course areas. You know, one other interesting aspect of all that is like the idea that students aren't just using it to to you know to do work in their class they're using it because it is a skill that is in some ways going to be required in the workforce once they get out right and so as an instructor sort of embracing it is also going to be imperative because you're you know you're developing the workforce for the next for the next generation uh and so i i think that's another thing that maybe it does get discussed but maybe not as much and how how impactful it will be to make sure that you know, the the people that are coming out of these course areas are going to have to also understand how to utilize it in the workforce as well. Yeah, I think that's that's really important that the, it's it's not just an impact on education. I mean, this are going to be a set of tools that are going to be used extremely widely and will be integrated into every aspect of the workforce. And, you know, to some extent, a majority of the people are now going into a knowledge based workforce. And so people are going to be employed for their ability to use knowledge. And what that means is that they're going to have to have what we call our 21st century skills. So communication, collaboration, critical thinking. And um, this new generation of AI doesn't really replace all that. It still can be used for it, but it's not supplanting those skills. So what we really want is students who can be able to use these tools, but also to think critically about how they're using those tools. How do they use them to enhance their jobs? How do they use them to enhance how they communicate with others or how they could use them to help with brainstorming? And I think one of the real opportunities is integrating them into the classroom now and letting students use them is they can use ChatGPT as a brainstorming school tool or as a tool to help improve their critical thinking. So I think a lot of people think, oh, well, it's just going to write an essay and that's what I needed to do. But it can be used more that you can use it much more of a Socratic way where a student can ask it a question, get some ideas, and then work with it to try to hone their ideas and then go out and write something. And so it it really can be used more as this kind of a critical thinking tool that will then be the kinds of things they're going to need in the workforce. Yeah, and the, the critical thinking uh, piece has come up so much. I and mean, one of the questions we asked in the survey, um, both of students and instructors, was like, what are your what are your biggest concerns around uh, generative AI? Uh, and interestingly, you know, uh, you know, academic dishonesty or cheating, sort of one of the largest that instructors and students have, which I think probably might surprise some people. But uh, the students also are concerned about uh, the, crit the loss of critical thinking. And that's sort of the number one thing instructors are also concerned about is the ability to get answers and generate answers so quickly without actually having to sit and do the work. Um, and a lot of the, you know, essay writing and things of that nature is sort of how instructors um, assess students' critical thinking historically, and that's definitely become one of the one of the sticking points. But I think the the positive sign for me in that is that students are also concerned about that too. It's like not just the thing that they're worried about, whether or not they sort of understand the impacts of utilizing it or utilize use it sort of um, uh, you know more appropriately. That would uh, uh, would be the the thing you'd want them to take away from that. But it's not always the case, I think, in, in these scenarios. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, definitely. So, I mean, I think it there 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 has to be sort of more thinking about how critical thinking is being used right. and particularly assessed in the classroom because you can still assess critical thinking, but it's more how do you employ these tools to enhance the critical thinking as opposed to supplanting what's critical thinking. Right. So it's interesting, like the impacts, um, we, we talked a little bit about the workforce and sort of what we expect the impact this to be down the line. I mean, we're still sort of in the very infancy stage of like generative AI in the, in the world, uh, you know, but it's already had a pretty profound impact on the day-to-day -day work life, I think of most people or many people, maybe not most. Um, I know it's, it's a resource for me now to go when I'm sort of having to write things or put things together or or get lists and and so on and so forth. It definitely has some limitations as sort of are widely uh, widely set out there. But you know, it is a, is a resource that I go to and utilize. Uh, and I also have to know what the limitations of it are, and also sort of what the privacy concerns are, because you know I work in an industry where we can't share certain bits of information on the web. Um, and so, like sort of navigating that has been interesting having been a party to work and research around that's made it a little easier for me but i imagine that's not the case for everybody that's working in industry these days um but uh but you know using it's one thing understanding it's another and so i think that's been an interesting challenge in uh in and of like sort of the professional world i'm kind of curious you know you're a researcher and um in in, in the academic environment like what how has it impacted your uh your world yeah i mean hey and it's impacted in different ways because I'm a researcher of AI and also <laughs> user of AI and 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 also a teacher at the same time. So I'm seeing AI in all sorts of different ways. But I'll I'll, I'll give an example, and this is actually pre-chat GPT because I started working with large language models before they were large language models. They were small <laughs> language models, but we incorporated them. And one of the things I did was I was teaching uh, large introductory psychology classes with 200 students in the class. And what I had learned, because part of it is I also study learning, and that's part of psychology, is that I knew that if I made my students write every week, that they would learn the material better. Uh, but on the other hand, as a newly minted professor, I also knew that I could not grade 200 essays <laughs> each weekend uh, because I still like to watch football games and do other things on the weekend. Um, and so one of the things that I and my colleagues developed was a system that could uh, assess students' writing. But it's not just giving a grade. It was actually giving comments about the content. And I put this in my class, and what I told the students to do is that every week they'd get a writing assignment. They could write it, submit it, they would hit submit, it would come back within three seconds with a grade and comments on their essays. They could then revise their essays based on those comments and then resubmit it. And they could do that as many times as they wanted. Uh, and what we found, and we did some studies on this, is that one, I didn't have to grade 10 drafts of every student yeah. essay there. But students could still submit a draft of the essay if they wanted me to review it or get any extra feedback. But I could track everything that the students were doing. I could see when the students were writing, how much they were writing. And we found that students actually learned the material much better. And part of that was changing the focus away from thinking of writing as just summative, I want to grade them, but more that writing is a learning exercise. And the fact that they wrote something and got feedback and then revised it but could get feedback immediately is what really improved them. And I think that's sort of the lesson that we sort of want to think about in terms of the sort of new generative AI is how do we employ this in ways that it can give feedback, but still keep the teacher in the loop there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's uh, super compelling. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we've utilized some of that same product model in, in higher ed at, at Pearson. And interestingly, you know, I'll share, share sort of a side anecdote that, you know, as we worked with instructors on that product, you know, within our built into some of our higher ed products that we sell, there was a lot of skepticism about that from an instructor when we were talking to instructors about it. Historically, I, I, you know, I'll be really interested to see how that evolves now that there's more familiarity around language models and generally what they do sort of in the in the sort of the mass market now. 
um, and how the sort of faculty perceptions around these kinds of technologies built into other products sort of evolve as well. And so that's something I'll definitely be uh, looking forward to in the future. Um, so one other thing it's you know we we mentioned it sort of lightly earlier but like faculty still see the use of like these generative ai products as a form of academic dishonesty in most cases um and and students really want and we've gotten this from uh from surveys that students really want faculty to sort of set expectations for them we've had we've had students and focus groups tell us that um, they they haven't used uh, ChatGPT yet for anything because they're afraid to, and a lot of cases because they don't know what the limitations are, uh, as an example. And so the theme that carries through these conversations is almost the need to sort of get back to basics in a way for instructors to set expectations at the beginning of the semester for them. Um, and so obviously tech has sort of evolved this in the industry, but um, do the fundamental elements of sort of the managing this in the classrooms or, or it, sort of in the academic setting generally remain the same in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, I think it, 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 it's a really good question. And I do think that things change a little bit. I mean, in some ways, I think you can still run your classes fairly much the same way, but you need to be aware of and think a lot more about how are you assessing, why are you assessing, and what are the different approaches that you're using for assessment? One of the things I've done is to encourage faculty to first look at their syllabus and look at all the assessments and activities they use and take some time and submit those to ChatGPT. See what ChatGPT does with them because I think one, as a uh, teacher, you'll learn a lot about what Chat. GPT is good at and bad at. Two, you will also learn something about the nature of the assessments you're currently using. I mean, if it can be answered by a computer, is it something that you should be using or do you need to amp it up some way or is there some other way of doing it? So, you know, in terms of sort of honing to academic dishonesty and whether students should be able to use it, I think first teachers should get familiar with it and then put that into your syllabi as a set of expectations. Some okay. schools have policy statements you can use, but I think also you may want to adapt your own to your own class for that. But I think beyond that, a lot more about it is to really think about what are the goals of the learning exercises you're doing in the class. So are you just trying to assess or are you trying to help students to learn? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, because, you know, if it's to assess four years ago, they could have looked it up in Wikipedia or exactly. a search engine yeah. probably get it. But it does mean maybe thinking a little bit of sort of how to change that exercise to get them to do something more. And maybe that may even be, well, submit this exercise to chat GPT, look at the answer and critique it, write your critique of what chat GPT said, what is correct, what is wrong, or use it as a way to get them to brainstorm. So I think part of it is to think about it sort of how do you, how do you use it as, as a tool in those ways. Yeah, I love that because it sort of does dovetail what we talked about earlier, which is that like you have to be prepared for this in some way. So like not just revamping your class for understanding that these things exist, but also sort of like how the impact of that is going to play in the role of your the students learning in your classroom. And so in order to address the academic dishonesty, you have to understand the impact that these things are going to have on the assessments that you're providing to your students. So I think that's a, that's a really great, uh, really smart, thoughtful answer to that. Yeah. And maybe let me turn the question around to you, because you've sure. been involved for a very long time, really on the side of developing, providing, uh, you know, great learning resources. So I'm sort of curious to sort of what are your thoughts on chat GPT as a way of, sort of finding or generating these uh, these learning resources? And how does that compare to you know, the ways the students have done it before. So either, you know, going to Google or looking yeah. at a textbook or pulling something out of Wikipedia. Yeah, uh, so it's a great question. And I think when um, I sort of my initial response to the the leadership at, at Pearson around this, because that was obviously the big concern is like, what's the impact to the business? And, you know, particularly in our assessment business, um, I think there was a lot of fear that students could just put the, the question into ChatGPT. And like, well, that's true. It doesn't 
like they could do that with Google before, right? We've already had issues around this for a long period of time. So it doesn't necessarily provide a new way to, to, you know, cheat or get around getting assignments per se, but it does provide a faster one. If that's, you know, that's one way to look at it. You know, we've talked to many students in um, focus groups and it, interestingly, they, to a, to a person, they talked about the idea that how much better chat GPT is than Google and uh, searches in a lot of ways, because, you know, there was still work to be done when you Googled something. It gives you a bunch of responses. You have to search through it to find the right one. When you're when you're on chat GPT, it literally gives you the verbatim answer that you might be able to utilize. And while at times cannot be true, and students are fairly well aware of that, they're willing to take the risk in some of those instances. Um, it does remove a lot of the barriers and the, the, the pace. And like, as you talk to students, the thing that they always are interested in is how do I do, how do I optimize my time more effectively, right? And so when thinking about this, if you were already going to look things up in Google, you're definitely going to more like, you know, err on the side of ChatGPT in that sense, because it's just faster, it's easier, it's more seamless, you know, it's not maybe always the right way. And to your point, there's definitely a more effective um, learning environment that you can utilize around that. But, uh, but yeah, I, you know, I, I think it was very clear from the first survey through the focus groups up to now that students are fairly, um, fairly confident that this is a far better way to look up information. Um, you know, the accuracy of which they'll have to sort of, um, confront at some point when they're managing that, but, um, it's definitely faster, more efficient way to get the, get, get at the information that they're looking for. Um, so, but that leads us to, uh, you know, how to, how to like, then how do instructors deal with that? How do they manage this? And so, you know, what are what are your uh, thoughts around detecting plagiarism? Uh, you know, that's tough for faculty. Um, there's a bunch of AI detectors out there. Some famously have not done so well. Others still po fairly popular. You know, how how valid is this technology, and where do you see this going? Yeah, and that, it's a it's a really important question. I get asked this all the time, and. Uh, what also worries me is that some people just say, well, I, there are plagiarism detectors out there, so I'll just use those and that will solve the problem. And I think, you know, I think that there's, there's really three, three sides of this. The first is, okay, so what about plagiarism detectors? The second is, what are, what are your policies? And the third is, how do you bring chat GPT into what you're doing? So, but on this first one, sort of what about plagiarism detectors? There's now been a lot of research on these plagiarism detectors, and they don't work all the time. And they, what they have is what's called a high false alarm rate, which means that if you're teaching a class of 200 students, there may be 10 to 20 students who made a good faith effort of writing this on their own, and they will get detected and flagged as having used uh, a large language model for it. And there's no way that they can really easily prove that they didn't. And there's been a number of uh, cases out there on, on the internet of students talking about, what do I do with this? How do I prove it? Uh, and even a case of one uh, professor failing a whole class because he did not use the plagiarism detectors correctly and just said, oh, it looks like everybody plagiarized. So. Mm -hmm. I caution faculty about using these. Um, the, the, there's, there's actually a, a lot of understanding of the statistics of how they work that almost has to be understood to do it. Um, so that says, okay, so you can't just say we're going to use those. So then the second thing is to set policy. So you want to set policy to tell instructors when, or tell students when they can use ChatGPT when they can't, um, and so try to put that in there. But I think the third part is is really figuring out how to embrace it and use it in the classroom. So you can give assignments and tell students that the first they can submit uh, a version to ChatGPT to get some get some of their ideas to help develop their ideas. But it goes back to sort of the old idea of show your work, that students need to produce all the, all the examples that ChatGPT did and show the evolution of their work, show how they took what was in there, how they played with those ideas, how they built them better. 
And I think that's that's really critical because part of being an educated workforce once they get out of school is not just about producing something, but really showing how did you do something to be creative or create something useful from it. So this is where I think it does say how you might want to change the course for it. And you might have to look through a lot more material. But as an instructor, you're embracing it, you're setting expectations with the students, and you're also teaching them how to use these kinds of tools in better ways. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's an interesting thing, the idea that, uh, you know, instructors never really want to get in this, uh, you know, you know, back and forth around academic dishonesty in the first place, because there's always, it was always a nightmare for them. But then you add in the idea that these detectors can fail. And like, you know, I, I imagine going in front of an academic review board, having to manage that would like be the last thing any, on any instructor's mind they'd ever want to do. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so uh, it, it's a, it's definitely not something that I think is like worth putting a whole lot of faith into as far as sort of managing. And I think a lot of the other things you talked about today, you know, are actually better resources at dealing with this. Um, and, you know, because what you really don't, you're not really trying to catch somebody. You don't really want to catch them cheating. You don't want them to cheat in the first place. And so if you can avoid that, I think that's the better first step. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely so. And, you know, so far we've we've mostly talked about sort of the instructor point of view. And I'm sort of curious because I know you also sort of spent a lot of time talking with the learners there. And I'm sort of curious what your impressions are of some of these cultural trends that are explaining why is generative AI resonating so much with current learners? Uh, it's a, that's an amazing, uh, it's amazing that it is. And that's a great question for that reason. Uh, the, you know, it's interesting, I, like in the, there was a narrative that uh, in June and July, the uh, the usage of ChatGPT had dropped like roughly 10% each month. And it was sort of, I think a lot of people thought, oh, okay, that means that you know, people are no longer interested in it. And my first thought was that's because school's out, right? There's nobody in school there in the summer. And so, the, you know, it was, it was our impression that a lot of the drivers of this have definitely been from students. Um, and, you know, when you talk to them, that's definitely the case and sort of like, you know, like tagging that to what I said earlier, students are always looking for ways to optimize their time. And I think ChatGPT is one of the most efficient tools ever developed. And so for them, it really does, uh, it does sort of dovetail with the things that they're trying to achieve, which is how do I get through this work as quickly as possible? It's not always the best learning tool, as I said before, but it's definitely what they're, what they're aiming to, to try and get. Uh, get achieved. The, you know, even within the e-text, you know, we for years we've been told by instructors that students don't read the book anymore. And then we would meet with the students uh, over time and say, you know, we know you don't read the book. And they would be like, oh, what do you mean? We read the book. And so then you're like, okay, now I need to dig into this more. So what do you mean by read the book? Um, and they'll say, well, I, I, I go to the thing that I need to look up either in the glossary or in the search, if you're in the e-text, and I just look that material up. Um, and so it was sort of fascinating. We started digging into this, like, this is another way to do the same thing, right? Like students don't read the book from cover to cover, from chapter open to chapter end. That's not a thing that they do. And they haven't done that for a long time now, um, you know, much to most instructors chagrin, right? But at the end of the day, like chat GPT definitely sort of sits in that area or space that the thing that they were already doing, it really just amplifies their ability to do it more quickly in a lot of ways. And so I do think like there are ways to effectively incorporate this technology into products to actually help students learn um, th that sort of takes advantage of the thing that they're trying to do, which is learn more efficiently. If you talk to most students, they'll tell you, I don't actually want to cheat. I just don't have the time to do the thing that I'm being told I need to do. And so if you can help them learn more efficiently, by utilizing some of this technology. I think you can sort of embrace it and sort of embed it in the right way to do that. Um, and so, uh, you know, when you talk to students about the e-text, let's say I'd go to the search box. So how can we utilize that sort of, you know, already um, experienced behavior and sort of an emphasize, like this is taking you to the place you need to go and sort of giving the information you need to at your fingertips um, is sort of one example. Um, or sort of how do you serve it up in the moment that they're looking for it to 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 get the information that they're that they're looking for. But um, I do think like, you know, it's the ability to have information at your fingertips while we've like, I, I, you know, you know, the Internet was the beginning of that cell phones, sort of the next evolution of that. You know, I think generative AI is sort of the next evolution of that same thing, which is 
you have everything you need at your fingertips and you can get it as quickly as possible. And I think um, students were very, very quick to respond to that. And I think that's still, they're still the drive, the main driving factor from my perspective uh, of, the, of the technology today. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point because in some ways we're we're at very early days with generative AI. And part of it is that most of the time when students and teachers are using it, they're just going out and directly typing in a query or creating a prompt and, and doing it. I think what's going to be changing over the next few years is greater and greater integration of those into tools, tools for the learners, tools for the instructors. And that's going to really build some new things that are going to provide much better support and much more contextualized, much more personalized. Um, and that's that's where I think we're going to see a big change. And to some extent, I think everybody's learning from the experiences of just students going out and using it now. But where the strength is going to be is in the actual having tools that are really custom designed for the kinds of things that students and teachers will need. Yeah, I, there's a responsibility aspect of that too, right? Like the the idea that these things can sort of veer you off course very quickly. Um, I, you know, there's an ethical and responsible way to sort of develop this technology, you know, particularly externally as the language models themselves, but also sort of internally, depending on how you're incorporating those models into your products to do it in a way that sort of guides students and gives them the right information at, at the right time. Um, but also doesn't give them the answer, right? In all cases, I, you know, there's obviously a fine line there. And so, um, you know, my hope is that the language models continue to evolve as well. And so they get better at, you know, not just like not, um, not, not delivering hallucinations or, or erroneous information, but also they get better at sort of citing their sources, potentially things of that nature that are really valuable to sort of the academic pursuits. Um, and so, so like we're we're certainly going to work on like what we can do within Pearson when we work on developing products around those kinds of things and and ideals, but you know I I do I do also hope that the models themselves sort of improve so that it's a lot easier for us and students and all users really to sort of trust the information coming from them at the end of the day. Yeah, I think the trust is a really big area, and uh, I've I've seen this in a lot of cases of AI that it, it's very easy to get an AI to do something that works 90% of the time. It's getting yeah. that last 10% there. And that's where you need to be able to do it that's going to engender that trust. You know, it's sort of the same with self-driving cars. People have been talking about having them. And, you know, yeah. self-driving cars, they can drive pretty well. But do you really want something that drives like a 16-year-old? No, you want something <laughs> so out there that's going to be perfect. And so I think that's sort of where the field's going to continue to work is to really get that next last 10%, even though it's a lot of work to get that last 10% working. Yeah. As the father of a 16 year old driver, I can tell you, you do not want it driving like a 16 year old. So yeah. So I totally, <laughs> um, all right. Uh, well, thank you, Peter. That was a, that was a great conversation. I, I appreciate the the time and it was, uh, it was great to actually hear your side uh, or your, your perspective uh, this time rather than, uh, sort of the perspective of others. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we'll get to do this again. Great. Well, thank you, Norrin. I really appreciate this. And it's, it's really fun discussion to have. Yeah, great.